Oh. Um, all right, well, thanks, Jennifer, for inviting me up here. I wish I'd been able to uh, be here for some of the earlier discussion that the one that was going on when I walked in. Um, so I'm going to try to stick around this afternoon even if I don't answer a question for you. Um, during lunch, I'm happy to talk to anybody um, after, afterwards this afternoon. Sorry, I'm walking away from the mic. Um, so what Jennifer asked me to do, uh, come and sort of walk you through the pipeline task force, the process, and then I think more importantly some of the outputs from the pipeline task force. So I think as you know, um, my boss Bill Schuette and DEQ Director Dan Wyant were the co-chairs of the task force. Um, so that's what we'll do, we'll walk through work. Okay. So here's what we're, we're going to walk through fairly quick. I'm going to try to do this in about uh, 20 or 25 minutes uh, so we can leave some time for questions. So why did we start the task force? Who was on it? What was the task force looking at? How did we gather information? Um, what were the recommendations? And then uh, implementation of those recommendations. So the reasons for forming the task force. Um, so in July 2010, we had the unfortunate um, Bill from Line 60 in the California River. Um, I was uh, in the State Emergency Operations Center for the first week and a half or a couple of weeks. People like Ralph were there forever, probably still are. Um, so, right, that as sort of a background, that was, as far as I know, um, one of the only pipeline spills in, in Michigan. And it is the largest inland spill in the U.S., and still it is. And hopefully, it will remain the largest. Uh, so we don't have any others. Um, the other issue that was going on, right, as everybody's aware, um, you can see these are sort of rough charts, but a great increase in production of oil in North America and the US, and so we're transporting a lot more oil by pipeline along with a lot of other um, transportation methods. And then finally, um, sort of a shout out to the National Wildlife Federation. <clears throat> in October of 2012, they came out with their report, and I know the <coughs> gentleman from the Coast Guard was saying, yeah, yeah, well, we've known there's a pipeline there forever. Um, I have to confess, and I think most of these people in this room probably had to confess, you didn't really know there was a pipeline running in the Straits of Mackinac until that report came out. So um, that was sort of the, the context um, where my boss and other people in the state sort of began to get concerned. So you've probably all done this, and I'm going to assume that most people in this room are pretty aware of the issues. Again, the Straits, they don't actually glow red, but that's the Straits pipelines are there. Um, this is, I'm sure you've seen this map before as well. That shows line five running through the UP and down through the Sarnia from Superior. Um, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but you know, a few bullets. Um, again, the, there was a, a pipeline uh, completed to Superior, Wisconsin. And in the 50s, Enbridge, correct me if I'm wrong, was sending that oil down by Lakers um, from Wisconsin to Sarnia. Obviously, with ice and things like that, that was not the most efficient way to carry oil for them. Um, and also, there was increased production. So, in 1953, for better or worse, it's a pretty amazing thing that happened. Um, the company was able to design get a statute passed that would allow the state of Michigan to give them an easement, get an easement, and build 645 miles of pipeline in about 14 months. Um, and again, this is sort of a key issue. The reason the state has a level of involvement here is because there is an easement. The state doesn't own the bottom lines on the straits uh, of Mackinac. Um, so on behalf of the people, the state owns that property. So there is this easement. Um, that requires inverts to engage with uh, with the state. Um, and so those are some of the important points about the easement. So there's a standard of care. It's a reasonably, reasonably prudent operator standard. Um, very broad indemnification provision in the easement that requires inverts, if there is a spill, to compensate the state and, and private citizens for all of the damage that is done. Um, and then there are some inspection and disclosure requirements. Well, um, and again, you probably talked about this, over half a million barrels a day of oil, um, light crude, and natural gas liquids is transported. 
So the members, I won't go through the, you know, as might be expected, these are the relevant agencies. My boss, who is the lawyer for the state, um, and every state agency, DEQ obviously has an interest, Office of the Great Lakes. The DNR um, <coughs> as the holder of the easement. So DNR is the state agency that um, holds the easement, um, as well as being a huge property owner that has, not only does, has pipelines crossing it, has the potential for pipelines to cross it. State Police for Homeland Security Emergency Response issues, um, the PSC, and then again, MDOT, because they do have quite a few crossings of um, roads with pipelines. So, back up notes real quick. so the scope of the task force. So everybody is rightfully focused on line five, but the, the task force is looking a bit broader than just line five. So line five is the impetus, again, um, but these are, and this, a lot of these I just lifted out of the, um, excuse me, the task force report, are all of the liquid petroleum, um, we'll get to what the standards were, but basically large tr transportation pipelines in the state. So that's not a very good map, but I see that that was also in, I think, Enbridge's um, pamphlet as well. So not a small number of pipelines, but you know nothing like Texas or Louisiana. So um, thank gosh I was there. Um, so here was here was the scope of the task force: liquid petroleum products. We're only looking at large intra and interstate pipelines. Only did look um, not doing natural gas. Uh, we weren't looking at upstream pipelines, gathering lines from um, oil fields until we get into a large pipeline or other kinds of pipelines that are just within a certain facility or property don't actually connect and transport large quantities of, of petroleum products. So the process, right? So I think some people, I've heard it, um, I get a lot of emails frustrated that maybe the state didn't do more um, with this task force. Well, part of the problem, again, until 2010, we hadn't been involved in um, responding to the pipeline spill. Um, there is federal preemption of most of these pipelines. So the, the, the construction and the operation of these large pipelines is under federal law and largely preempted. So the state didn't have a lot of experience. We didn't have technical experience. We know people who are pipeline engineers um, at the state. We don't have a lot, we don't have people in my office who have dealt a lot with this. We do now. Um, she works for me. She spent five years working on line 6B. Um, but we were facing a pretty steep learning curve. Um, this was all pretty new um, to us as well. So part of the process here was to try to figure out what it was we didn't know and what you know what was important and what wasn't. And that's that's where we had to start from. So in order to, to assist, um, a lot of the work was done with work groups. The first work group did most of the, well, the first two work groups really did the, the bulk of the lifting. Um, so the first work group looked at, you know, what other states do in terms of pipeline siting, what other states do in terms of regulation, um, what can we do under federal law, um, are there programs that we could assume or that could we take more responsibility if we want to do that. Um, second bullet is obviously important as well, which is um, emergency planning and response. Um, and we've had some discussion about that. Again, I think there have been um, parties that have been engaged in looking at these pipelines in response. Um, I have to say that I don't think the state was fully engaged until the last, um, the last few years. So I think we discovered that. And then the last bullet, and you know, we knew this before we came in, but it became very clear during the process that this is something the public is very interested in. They want the information, they want to be able to go somewhere and get all the information and not have to go to websites. So that was another focus is, okay, how do we, once we gather this information, that information, around, how, do we, how do we do that most effectively? So here are the um, groups, the, the pipeline, the task force itself, um, and I must say my boss was at every meeting, all of the um, agency heads were at every single meeting. So this wasn't just something they opened up or started and then did a 10. They were all there for all of the meetings. So we had what, one, two, three, four, five, seven, <coughs> seven pre presentations, um, pretty diverse set of uh, viewpoints. Uh, at least that's what we were, we 
were trying to get. Uh, NWF, obviously, they came in first. They were the ones who I think in a lot of ways um, started to focus on the Straits Pipeline. Enbridge, um, obviously, it was important to have them come in. We did talk to the Pipeline and Hazard Material <coughs> Safety Administration, FINSA, which is the federal agency um, that regulates the operation and construction of pipelines. Uh, oil and water don't mix campaign. I'm not going to remember everybody, but it's been a certainly part of that. No? No. We, so, we spoke to you, though. Separately, you did. We did. Okay. So these are all official. We did also have separate little sidebars. Um, I think for love of water is in that group. Okay. Um, Great Lakes Commission, I don't know if you know, they did a, a study that they issued last fall on all of the transportation um, methods of oil across the Great Lakes, which is uh, pretty interesting because obviously um, the current reality is that we're going to have to move oil. And so, you know, how are we going to do that? Is it going to be pipelines? Is it going to be trains? Is it going to be tanker uh, trucks? Um, you know, I think there's a consensus that generally speaking pipelines have the best safety record. They also have, unfortunately, the largest potential for um, having a big uh, spill. Uh, then Marathon, which uh, operates the only refinery in Michigan, um, they came and spoke to us. And then Ken Winters and, and James Hill were from Central Michigan, and they did a presentation sort of an economic, non-regulatory economics analysis of maybe how you address um, these large pipelines. Um, so tribes were an important part of this. We had one in-person consultation and a second consultation um, with our tribal partners to get input from them. They also gave us uh, lots of written input as well. That was helpful. And then again, we had a, a ton of input, from them, uh, lots of emails, calls, and then the work groups did go out and do their own um, research. So after about a year, um, we, we <laughs> my office worked very hard to try to get this um, report out. And so we came up with 13 recommendations, four directed to the Straits, and then four were, or eight, nine, math not very good, nine were statewide recommendations. So the Straits specific ones are um, probably what has been the focus of the discussion here. That's what we're focusing on first. Um, so the first one is preventing transportation of heavy crude through the Straits. So when this all started, there was a lot of concern about heavy crude being transported. Early on in the process, Enbridge, I think twice, assured us that they don't transport heavy crude on that line, and they didn't intend to. So I know a lot of people said, well, this is silly. Why are you doing this? Well, um, again, I, we take Enbridge at their word. But the fact is, over the course of the of the task force, to be attacked by a fly now, um, the it became clear there is a demand for heavy crude. Marathon has the capacity and could use more heavy crude in their refinery. Um, they have uh, they went through a retrofit and they largely process heavy crude. What um, now? Despite that, Enbridge after Marathon um, told us that they certainly had the capacity for, for more said, no, we're not, we don't have any plans to do it. Nonetheless, we think it's important to have something that's binding and enforceable um, that will not allow the transportation of heavy crude. And again, that's because uh, there is, nobody knows how to clean up heavy crude number one. Um, it's difficult enough, it's <coughs> difficult enough in the Kalamazoo River. Um, it's out in the, in the Great Lakes, uh, Coast Guard is acknowledged, we don't really have the technology to chase it, chase it down. Um, once it gets out into the environment, the, the heavy crude will separate from the light crude it's mixed with, and the heavy crude is going to sink. Um, second one, which is very important, is uh, an independent risk analysis. So I, I know when I came in, you were talking about worst case scenario. Um, I talked to you a little bit about our learning curve. We don't have all of the people, the experts we need to make that judgment. So what we're going to ask Enbridge to do is to pay for an independent study of what is the worst case scenario, what would be the result of that, what would be the damages, economic and otherwise, of a worst case spill um, from line five. The third one, I understand there were questions about this. Um, 
again, you know, we think it is important as the easement holder, as the, the title holder of the property that runs over, um, that Enbridge provides us with an alternatives analysis. So explain to us, and A, B, C, and D are just some, some examples of what we want to look at. What, what, what are the alternatives to having a line five in the streets? Um, is that no pipeline, we do it other ways? Um, is it, um, you know, do you utilize other transportation methods? Are there improvements that could be made? Or does nothing need to be done at all? So it's a perfect pipeline. Um, I don't know. Um, and I don't think anybody, I mean, I know people have opinions, um, but we need the information from people who are actually trained in these things to tell us um, what are, the, are there alternatives? What are the viable alternatives? What are the cost benefits of those different types of alternatives? So again, here's here's the rationale um, for that recommendation. And then finally, um, the last of the straight specific, we're getting additional information from Enbridge. Most of these are sort of go forward um, things. Informate as we went through the process, as we saw what we think is required to the easement. Um, these are some of the things that we felt, A, B, and C, some things we felt that Edwards should be providing to the state as the easement holder where this, this line crosses. Um, there, you know, there was a little bit of a misunderstanding about the information we got from Enbridge during the process. Um, I think we straightened that out. We met with Enbridge on Monday. Um, the, the problem we had was the, the way that the information was provided. Not that we believe Enbridge was hiding from us. We believe we got all of the information we asked for. Um, some of that information we could only do through the portal. We didn't actually possess it. There wasn't really a way for us to effectively um, <coughs> utilize that. And so that, I think, got spun in maybe a different way um, than it should have. So I don't, the state does not in any way any, does not believe that it didn't give us what we asked. The problem is partially ours because we don't have to we look at it partially it was the way that it's provided to us. So we need to talk through that with Enbridge. And frankly, the information that was of the most concern to us and the most interest were inspection reports and integrity reports. How do we know, how, how do we as the state know whether or not this pipeline is actually safe? Um, and when we do the risk analysis, you know, that will be part of it. Um, part of it is somebody is going to have to look at all that stuff and give us a professional judgment on whether or not there are integrity problems or there are issues with um, with the pipeline. So that that will be addressed going forward, and that again is the conversation we are having about how how we do that, how we identify the appropriate experts, and whether or not Enbridge is willing to um, pay to have those experts or to have those experts, independent experts, do that work for us. State. So the statewide recommendations are a little less sexy. Um, I heard that word used. So coordinate mapping. I mean, this is sort of important. One of the things we realized is that we had various agents. You know, there are maps out here. You can see where line five is. You can see where line six is. Um, but the, the various agencies had different maps. There was no central database. And the other important thing about maps is, you know, what kind of layers can you put on that? So. Right, we can identify where um, line five crosses the straits, I and mean, that's a no-brainer. But you know, you know wetlands, other natural resources, how close is the pipeline to those? Where is it in, in terms of being near population centers? Where is it in terms of being on state land? So one of the things we want to do is try to get the state to have a central database where, and this is important for emergency response, where you could simply pull up all the layers and you know exactly here, okay, here we the spill, what are the potential uh, problems we might face with that. So this is both sort of reactive and it's proactive in terms of planning in case there are other pipelines that are, are, that are planned or proposed. Um, making sure that state agencies were collaborating in emergency response. They were, I mean, don't worry about that, but it was a good opportunity to make sure we had plans in place, that, that we had people who were getting the um, appropriate training, so they could put on the space suits so they have to go into the, into the, um, the ditch when line slept at six first. So those, those kinds of things, and just making sure that, that overall the state was coordinated on emergency um, response. Then the third piece was, again, I think, and whether this was the state's fault or maybe fault isn't even the 
right word. Um, <coughs> You know, the state now wants to be more proactive in trying to reach out to federal partners, to Enbridge, to, to tribes, to local units of government, and make sure that they're involved in exercising um, with these response. So, um, the Indian, I, I attended the Indian River um, exercise, and it was good. Um, you know, state police, I think, probably should have had a bigger role. I pointed that out to Enbridge, I pointed that out to state police. So, since state police is our, um, you know, here's the pyramid, state police is right here on emergency response. They need to be involved in the kind of thing. So, I think what we want to try to do is be more proactive with um, other partners on that. Um, there was some discussion between our PSC and FEMSA in terms of, of sharing information, getting information, but we had to establish good relationships. So that was one of the, that's one of the things we're going to do again, is try to proactively, whether it's quarterly or by, you know, biannually, meet with, with FEMSA so we can understand um, what they're doing and what concerns they have and make sure that we know that. Um, legislation, sorry, I'm probably, am I running way too long? Um, spill response, so, right, the state, for whatever reason, other facilities, hazardous materials facilities, they have, we have to have a spill response plan, and we have to be notified if there's a spill. That's not true for oil. So if the state was never directly contacted, because they didn't have to be, when line six, um, line six feet, when the line six feet problem was. Obviously they were there and they knew it, but there wasn't any requirement. Um, the third thing which we noticed in resolving, which we've now done the, the uh, all of our issues with Enbridge, um, there was no litigation. We were able to, to get a consensual resolution. Our state law is probably a little weak on civil fines. Um, and so that's another thing that we suggest that the legislature should look at um, is raising the uh, civil fine level. Um, we're going to look at whether we there are other parts of the FIMSA program that we can still do. do gas safety inspections. We don't do liquid petroleum pipeline inspections for FIMSA. You, can, you have the opportunity to, on their behest or on their behalf, um, the state go out and actually conduct inspections. Um, so we're going to look at whether we should do that, whether we have resources to do that. Um, then. Uh, Improving the siting process, this would be a going forward thing. There are rules for siting, but we thought those should be looked at to make sure that we're creating these, not allowing uh, pipelines to be put in places they shouldn't be. Um, I think this is probably of some interest to people, is creating the safe, this is safety advisory, pipeline safety advisory committee by executive order, um, which will hopefully have a broad representation. One of the advantages of having one of these committees is that it comes up by law if committee asks them questions or seeks information has to um, to that committee so <laughs> it's a good interface for the public to be interfacing with government officials it's also a good way for the state to interface with the uh, with the federal government <coughs> and then last um, we are still building this up we had a pipeline task force website while it was going on um, and tried to keep that populated with the presentations we were receiving the final report is there um, we want to have a permanent website where people can go a you know, central place and even if it's just get links to other places, at least you don't have to go all over the internet trying to find out information um, about pipeline. Um, so just to end quickly, straights are, are absolutely the first priority and one, two, three, and four, they go in that order. Get the agreement on heavy crude, get the risk analysis and make sure we've got adequate financial assurance from Enbridge alternatives analysis and then getting this information. Uh, we did meet with Enbridge um, this week. It was the first meeting. It was a, it was a productive meeting. Um, we're already, we had already provided a proposed agreement um, to Van Heavy Crew. They are looking at that. Uh, and we also had a good discussion about how process-wise, how do we move forward? If we're going to ask Enbridge to pay for these two studies, how do we do that um, and make sure that um, it is both independent, but Enbridge has some oversight of the process. It's just giving us a blank check to go hire someone. Um, so I think the deliverables on those are going to be coming out pretty soon. I, we hope to have the agreement executed fairly quickly. I can't make any promises because now us lawyers are involved. Um, but we, we hope that we might have that um, pretty, pretty soon. So we, we are working on trying to get these things 
uh, rolling so that people know that something is actually going to come out of this process. Uh, statewide recommendations, uh, again, we had various things as we were going along. I feel like we satisfied those pretty well. Um, the coming soon, I, I think we will have um, something fairly quickly on creation of, a, of the advisory committee. Um, I think legislative proposals will come out fairly soon. Um, and again, we want to try to get moving on to this website and make sure it's the best thing. So, sorry, I probably did go long, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm Dave Holtz, and this year, and, and when the report came out, um, a lot of attention, big spotlight on it. Uh, the Attorney General was on radio, uh, I think on July 25th, and said uh, the pipeline's days are numbered. Um, the information and the process that we all wanted to hear suggests that the pipeline's decades may be numbered. I mean, it just seems like, can you just clarify what he meant by that? Uh, because it's our belief, and we've written letters uh, as part of the Oil and Water Don't Mix campaign expressing this in, in a lot of detail, that you have the authority right now to go into court and shut down that pipeline. Right, and I, I think I said this back in Grand Rapids because I'll never agree that I don't have a legal authority to do something. Okay, so yeah, we can debate that. I guess it goes back to me to, you know, I think what the Attorney General, the primary point he was trying to make was, I, this, we probably wouldn't put a pipeline there today. In, in, under today's standards, we probably wouldn't give the permission to do that. Um, I don't think I'm saying that it's that it's decade that it has decades. I, I, what I'm saying is I don't know, um, and I guess I don't. I'm not a person who likes to pretend like I know when I don't. I don't know. I mean, this thing has been operating for 63 years with, as far as we know, no incident, and so. Um, but I don't have the information to know whether there is some horrible, the magnitude of the risk here is huge. I mean, I think we can all agree that, right? So if we have a problem, huge magnitude. So if you're doing risk analysis, the back end is if something happens here, it's going to be awful. Okay, but as part of that risk analysis, you have to have the probability that something is going to happen. And I don't, I don't have that information. I don't pretend to understand whether or not this thing is just rock solid and there's the 99.9% .9 chance it will never fail, or whether it's 50-50, because that makes a huge difference to me, right? If it's 50-50 with that magnitude, you know, that's my personal opinion. But I think that the risk analysis and the alternatives analysis, the point is to give us the information to make decisions. So as a lawyer, um, you know, I, again, this is my personal opinion, and I had to go argue that case right now, but, that there is, I have demonstrable evidence that this must be shut down now. I, I don't, I don't, not sure that I have. I'm not sure that I have the when the when the judge says, "What is your evidence that this has to be shut down right now?" I'm not sure what I would point. To. I would have to argue there's a huge, horrible magnitude risk, and then I would get the question, "Okay, you got that? What information do you have that this is about to happen, or is imminently about to happen?" That, that to me, I think, and again, this is my opinion is the piece that's, that's missing. And that that's what I'm hoping some independent experts can help us to, to understand. What about the violation of the easement agreement? Yeah, so, right. So I, I technically there was a violation. Right? There were not supports every 75 feet at some point. Um, again, when you have to go argue something in front of a judge, which before I became a manager, I used to do. Um, yeah, you know, there's technical violations and there's violations. Could, could we go in because there wasn't a support every 75 feet to shut down any $610 million asset that's been operating for 50 years? I, I don't, I'm not sure we'd get a judge to do that because they weren't technically in compliance. Okay, well, what was the harm? What was the harm from this? So, yeah, there, I, 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 there were violations. I agree. There's information I think probably we should have had and or we weren't actively seeking and they weren't providing, maybe that's a technical violation as well. Um, so yeah, I, there's certainly, you know, you can debate it, I think, but 
from my perspective, um, and I think obviously as reflected by the task force, that they felt like there was some information, some more information we needed for that before any judgment was made about what we should have done. Right um, Cause I have a point of information for clarity. Did I understand that Michigan is about to begin its first risk analysis of this after 63 years? Uh, yes. Thank you. That is correct. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, a risk analysis was presumably done in 1953. I wasn't born yet. Um, so, uh, but yeah, um, again, I, I think, um, as I said, I don't think there were a lot of people in the state and probably a lot of people in this room that um, knew this pipeline was there until fairly recently. Or really, and, and really thought about it seriously, other than maybe some, some fleeting knowledge. Peter, I asked a similar question of Ainsa earlier, but I think the state has a little bit of explaining to do on this one as well. And uh, the question I asked was that in uh, Montana, after uh, a spill in the Yellowstone River, the state, the teams have worked with the state to get a water crossing survey done. And we asked for the same thing here in Michigan, but things have said this region didn't have the resources to do that, So, but they would work with the state to do it. And so we asked the task force to do that or consider it, and they said no. So maybe your recommendations on mapping and meeting with beings that regularly will get close to this, but we want you to know that a water crossing survey process exists, and we'd like Michigan to get it. Okay, no, that, that's an excellent point. I think, right, the, between creation of the, of the committee, which would allow us <laughs> to basically ask, ask things of PHMSA, and then right, the mapping is necessarily going to, that would be one of the things we look at. If we should have a map that doesn't just show us in gross terms where line five goes, we should be able to put on top of that a map of, of all the streams in the state and say, okay, where are these streams and, and what's going to happen if, if we have an accident in one of these streams. So no, it's a, it's a fair enough point. The task force, again, wasn't, didn't have any authority to do anything. I mean, it was, it was a, a convening of people that did have authority to do things, but they couldn't necessarily undertake something. But no, I do think, yeah, I do think that will be taken care of. Yeah, I think that's important. I also, I don't know that much about Montana's geography, but I'm guessing we've got a few more water crossings. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I've, uh, a thousand times more. <laughs> I have one comment. It seems like in the formation of your Michigan type, uh, Pipeline Task Force, knowing that you would be uh, trying to gain a, a better understanding of pipelines that you would have had somebody on your task force that either from the API or something like that so you could so he, they he or she could kind of explain to you so you could get a better understanding and kind of like that he brought up to speak to this point and the other thing was in your report uh, I didn't see any type of timeline um, and uh, so I'm wondering about that. I know that there was a lot of people that had questions. You had all this, you know, all these recommendations and everything, but as far as the timeline, okay, within one year, the, you know, your consulting people will be in place or, you know, those types of things because the citizens want to know that you're being active in trying to protect our health and well being and businesses and, you know, our tribal fisheries. Sure, no, and those, those are points well taken. And again, if you go back to when this started, when, when I was assigned to be the project manager of this piece, I, I didn't even know, I didn't know what to even ask for at that point. Um, so, you know, and it's, in terms of getting somebody from API, I mean, I think we want, we want somebody independent. So we're, we're gonna have to hire somebody. So that conversation was, was happening. Okay, we've got this stuff. We hire somebody right now to start looking at these inspection reports. Now, mind you, these inspection reports have been looked at by FINSA. It's not as if they're just, you know, nobody's looking at them. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we, now I can move forward and, you know, we want to have an independent person. I, that API is great, but they are patrolling that, you see. So I, I think if we brought in an API guy, and said, oh, the API guy I looked at it and said it was great. I think a lot of people would say, well, okay, I'd like somebody else to, to I'd like a second opinion. Yeah. Oh. And, the, and the deadlines, 
there was a lot of discussion about that as well. I, again, I, I think you're gonna start seeing deliverables coming out very quickly, um, like within weeks. Um, and, and then we will have timelines and some of these longer term things, the risk analysis and the alternative analysis. Again, remember, we're asking Enbridge to pay for those. And so we have to have a conversation with them first before we can move forward with those steps. Most things that I have a uh, risk benefit analysis. So far, we've talked all about risks. What are the benefits in Michigan in terms of financial and raw materials from this pipeline? Right. So I, I'm, I bet the Enbridge folks would be happy to, to have a talk about that too. Um, well, no, because we did ask the question. We did ask the question, and we got and we got some information back. So. There is propane delivery um, in the UP. It does carry some propane that's utilized in the UP. It does gather oil from northern Michigan, um, from the oil fields in northern Michigan. Um, in many counties in northern Michigan, it is the largest property tax payor um, in the county. Um, they have uh, full-time staff. I don't know what that number is. Um, it's not a huge number, but they also have temporary staff when they do construction um, and they do provide some light crude oil to marathon so I'm, I mean I'm not going to make the economic argument for it but there are some benefits most of the oil you know comes through and it spits out the back end in Canada I don't know what happens I don't know whether oil that gets refined in Canada is made in the gas that comes back into Michigan I don't know I don't know that but I think that would be part of the alternatives analysis. What are, what are the current benefits that the state receives at, at a parochial level? Because we want to know that. And then, you know, region-wide as well. I think you would have to have that analysis. Because you can't do cost benefits if you don't know what the, the full benefits are. Uh, my name is Rick Kane. Uh, I work with flow on a part-time uh, free basis. Um, First comment, uh, I think the task force report, in my view, is excellent. I really like it. Uh, personally, I like the alternatives assessment because it's got some of my fingerprints on it. Uh, but uh, beside that, that's kind of a long-term event. You know? uh, if you identify something and then you get to the implementation, it's gonna take some well. We, we have some additional recommendations coming your way, and they're more focused on the short-term action, because as you heard some folks, what happens between now and when the end of life occurs for the pipeline. Uh, being an old industry guy, uh, when we looked at a situation like this, we would typically put it in some kind of risk tier. Uh, in my view, it's certainly a top-tier risk, and anything that's a top-tier risk, you need immediately need to identify short-term extraordinary measures to bring the risks down and, until your alternatives put in place. This would be additional monitoring, more on-site uh, emergency response, a whole slew of things that would be signed off. And when we used to do this in the industry, I know not only the senior management, but the re regulators. So I guess my question after all of that is, are you looking at it's extraordinary short-term measures while all of this process is working on. Um, well, okay, so the low-hanging fruit was the heavy crude, right? So, I, I mean, I think, right, in, in terms of a, of a high risk, that was one that seemed very manageable and absolutely, you just, that's a number, you don't want heavy crude there. Okay, so, but you, you make a good point. And no, I can't say there were specific plans to do that, but I certainly will think about it. And in terms of, of, you know, people continuing to provide comments, they are, and we are still looking at them. So, the, you know, the process isn't done. Um, we're still collecting the information and we're using it. So, but yeah, those, that's an excellent point. Thank you. My question is, I guess, historical and legal. My understanding is the original easement called for a cap of 300,000 barrels a day, and we're at five foot. And I'm just wondering, how we as citizens, you know, who signs off on that? How do we know when that changes and why it changes? Right, so I will double check because I, I carry my easement with like, the U.S. Constitution. Um, <laughs> so, so I, there, there was not a per barrel limit. There was a pressure limit. 
which is they have never exceeded. Is that correct? Have you never exceeded? <laughs> yes, I, but no, there was, to my, there was never a, there was never a, I mean, there was never a limit on what they could carry specifically in the easement, and there was never a per barrel or per gallon limit item. They did have to, I think, seek permission from FINSA when they were going to increase the, the volume, and they did have to come into the PSC when they were going to make some improvements to the equipment to do that. But PSC's role is sort of, okay, what are they going to do? You know, is that safe? Is it problematic? Not, you know, do we care whether there's now 540,000 barrels versus whatever it was before, less than 500. But I'll double check on that. Well, then relatedly, how does pressure relate to barrels? I mean, there must be a point at which the pressure is a, is a safety problem in the pipe, yes? Well, yeah, and I'm sure there's somebody in here who can answer that question. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's intuitive that if you cram more stuff in there, it's going to be a higher yeah. pressure. But I don't know what when they reach the 600. The question is, how does the pressure relate to the volume? And at what point is the pressure too high? <laughs> so we're just going to keep passing. <laughs> so, so pressure is uh, related to volume for sure, and it, it goes in a bit of a curve. Um, so you get the first, let's say, fifty percent of the volume at a very low pressure, and then, and then it's kind of a, I think, I mean, the formula is a, a squared formula. It's the square of the volume is the pressure, or something like that. Square cube. Anyway, so long and short of it is they are related, but you can get, let's say, a 10% increase in volume with a very small increase in pressure at the low end, whereas if you have to get to the top end of your pipeline, you're, uh, to get a 10% increase in volume would require a significant pressure. In this case, for line five specifically, um, we're not operating at close to the, uh, especially at the straights, we're not operating at close to the pressure that puts the pipe close to yield strength. For pipe safety, we talk about yield strength, and that's the material property of the steel, and that's what we're really concerned about, making sure that we're not close to. PIMSA has got regulations, and we go to 72% of yield, or, or whatever the, the number is. Um, across the straits, we're operating at somewhere around, um, my I'm just going on memory, 20% or so of yield. Um, so we're not close to that yield strength of the pipe. The straight piping is the suction intake to the pump station at Macaulay, so that's what keeps it so long. <laughs> The other thing an operator can do is they can take and add additional pump stations along the line. So where they have a gradient, let's say the pump stations are 40 miles apart, and so you start at a pressure at one point, and it, dig, it drops in a gradient to the other, to the suction of the next pump station. You add a pump station in the middle, you don't increase the pressure overall, exceed the maximum operating pressure of the pipeline, but you can move more volume through the pipeline. So they do it that way as well, so. Right, and I think that's what occurred fairly recently with some upgrades and replacement of pump stations. A question, comment? Yeah. Uh, sometimes we think Enbridge, this pipeline, line five, is a rather small line compared to some others. If I'm not mistaken, the current volume going through there is currently the same volume going through the Alaska pipeline. They're running at, at reduced quantity, but about the same, I believe. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm, I'm willing to, to agree to the point that they're pumping a lot of pump pride. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, Peter, thank you very much. No, sure. Like I said, I won't be around. <laughs>